Want to listen to this Ivory Tower Boiler Room or True Crime and Academia episode ad free? Head on over to our Patreon, p a t r e o n dot com slash Ivory Tower Boiler Room to listen to all of our podcast episodes without any ads. You get access to our video episodes, our bonus episodes, and even more exclusive content, including merchandise. It only starts at five dollars a month, so head on over to our Patreon. Again, it's p a t r e o n dot com slash Ivory Tower Boiler Room. And while you're at it, you know what would be such a help is if you could rate and review the Ivory Tower Boiler Room on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and make sure that you follow us and share out our podcast to all of your friends. It truly does help, and I want to thank you all. It means so much that you're listening to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. I hope that you enjoy this episode. Hey, true crime friends. Welcome back to another episode of True Crime in Academia. I am your host, Mary DePippi. I hope you all had a wonderful week this week. I hope you are all looking forward to a relaxful weekend. I personally am looking forward to a semi-stressful weekend. Um, trying to make it easier for myself. So basically my boyfriend and I were going on vacation. Um, we're going down the shore for a couple of days and I'm so excited. I cannot wait. Um, you know, but doing all the packing and making sure we have everything, you know, I have taken on that responsibility. So, you know, everything just always feels like the last thing that you're remembering, um, you know, which is why I'm packing now. So that way, by the time we have to check in to our hotel room on Monday, you know, we have everything we could possibly need. Um, last week, I talked about the Bethany Rachel interview. I didn't listen to the last seven minutes of the second episode, um, but I did catch up I did listen to all three parts so I feel like I have a full-fledged opinion now um I still stand my previous statements um I still don't believe that she's sorry for what she did I think maybe she's sorry she was caught um I also do think she lied multiple times and Maybe not even lied, but like also just totally misrepresented certain things. And if she doesn't understand, like, for example, she talked about how Sheena offered her a place, but that she had to pay some rent. And then at some point she watched her cat because they had the cat had to have Sheena's cat had to have a mercury treatment and she was breastfeeding her daughter summer at the time so she couldn't be around the cat so she asked rachel to watch her cat now rachel said that they weren't friends however both of those actions described things that friends would do for each other you know i mean because when you think about the time that like Rachel was being offered this apartment and you know yeah you could argue you know if she was a real friend and making all this money which I don't think Sheena's making all of this money I'm sure she's making enough to survive in LA you know and with the lifestyle that she has and things like that you know she's definitely maybe a higher middle class but she's definitely not you know I mean and higher middle class for California you know I feel like that's another thing we have to take in mind. Like, this is set in California. Everything is so much more expensive than it is, you know, on, you know, or at least more expensive than it is in Jersey. So, 
you know, just to give a frame of reference, you know, but also this was sort of happening around, you know, newer pandemic time, you know, so the fact that Sheena wanted some sort of form of rent, like that doesn't, that doesn't scream bad friend to me, you know, that is, hey, here I have this place, like, you know, I'm sorry, I can't just give it to you outright to stay for free, you know, but at least it's somewhere you can stay, but then also, you know, down the road, like I said, you know, she asked, it's not like anyone held a gun to Rachel's head and said, you have to watch this cat. You know what I mean? Like, so the fact that she was trying to be like, oh, we're not friends. I'm like, well, you're doing some pretty friendly shit. You know what I'm saying? Also, as far as Ariana is concerned, you know, this was another discrepancy and it could go the same for uh, Sheena. It's the fact that she was just like, okay, Ariana and I weren't, like, best friends. But also, we were acquaintances who met through the show and then became good friends. I mean, there are also reports of Ariana and, you know, fuckhead Tom Sandoval going to her pageant events, you know, and hanging out with her off camera And the fact that she wants to play this narrative as if she wasn't friends, you know. And honestly, the fact that they're not friends doesn't, you know, whether she thinks or not they're friends, that doesn't fucking matter. It's the fact that, like, you know, this person is someone you knew. You knew that they were in a relationship with this person. And yet you still decided to pursue a relationship with the person. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, some of you out there might be like, okay, she's a little bit too pissed about this. That's because she, by she, I mean Rachel, she triggers me because I am someone who was cheated on by an ex and was cheated on by someone. I mean, obviously, you know, my ex was mainly to blame, but the other person involved knew who I was and knew we were together. So, like... You know, like, (sighs) I know they say to not expect yourself from other people, but I just feel like that's just standard girl code, you know? If you know a chick and she's been with this person, you know, you kind the depending on your relationship with said person, that they're kind of an untouchable, you know? So, (sighs) even if it was just like, You know, even if she's just like, yeah, you know, we're not that great of friends. Like, it's still the fact that, like, you knew this person. You knew this person and you knew that they were in a relationship with this other person. I'm sorry. I don't think you're that great of a human being if you can still look at those facts and then still go on and have an affair. You know, but anyway, that's all I have to say about that. There is going to be some more Bravo news in this news update, um, just because there's been a lot of politics and not that I don't want to talk about politics, but it's just, it was too much. I feel like we all need a breather. (laughs) So again, I'm sorry if this is not your cup of tea, then you're going to have to skip through a little bit. But for the rest of us, you know, let's get into the news update. Now, this first case is actually not celebrity <laughs> related, but it is a case that I do want you all to know about. Now, just after midnight on Sunday, August 20th, a 19-year-old woman named Andrea Vasquez and her boyfriend were attacked while sitting in his car that was parked at Penn Park on 13,950 Penn Street in Whittier, California. The boyfriend stated that the armed suspect approached the car and began shooting. He was able to escape, but when he returned to his car, he realized that Andrea was gone and there was blood near the vehicle. Andrea's body was discovered the next night in an open field in Moreno Valley. Later that afternoon, Whittier Police Department arrested 20-year-old Gabriel Esparza in connection with Andrea's murder. The LADA Community Violence Reduction Team assisted police during his arrest at his place of work. 
On Wednesday, police filed the following charges. One count of murder, one count of willful, deliberate, and premeditated attempted murder, one count of kidnapping to commit rape, one count of kidnapping, one count of assault with intent to commit rape, and two counts of attempted forcible rape. He is currently being held without bail. Now, honestly, I feel like part of me is like, I don't even need to know any more of these details, but also my morbid curiosity is just like, I want to know exactly what this fucking monster did to her. However, though, from the counts alone, we can kind of piece together, sadly, what happened to her and... Part of me wants to say it's a comfort, but it's also not a comfort. But it's just the fact that he wasn't successful in raping her, as far as they know at this point. You know, you're happy sort of for that. But then you also remember the fact that, you know, she fucking had to fight like hell and was probably fucking terrified the entire fucking time. And then was shortly killed after that. I mean, that is a fucking hell all of its own. Police have uncovered what they believe to be the gun used during the crime, along with Esparza's 2013 white Toyota Tacoma that had been taken into evidence. Now, police are still investigating this case. At this point, Esparza has entered a not guilty plea to the charges, and at this moment, it is unclear if he has an attorney to represent him. I have not seen a trial date as of yet, but I will keep you all posted on the progress. Obviously, Andrea's family was extremely affected by this, and a GoFundMe page was started by a woman named Deanna Ortiz. I'm not sure if she is a friend of the family, but from what I've seen, it seems legit. And I have the link listed below in the show notes if any of you want to donate, you know, just to help the family out. This next news update is an update on the Lizzo case. It's a very brief. Basically, she's planning to sue the backup dancers and she is planning on suing them for malicious prosecution. Now, personally, I part of me wants to believe that Lizzo's not a horrible human being, but Also, the other part of me is kind of just like, well, I also say it. So when it comes to that, I don't know. I just feel like she looks kind of desperate at this point. Like, (sighs) I don't know. I just feel like I would have expected more from her, I guess. But at the same time, if, you know, the allegations coming against her were false, then, you know, I can understand why she would be fighting them this hard. However, though... I don't know. I feel like she's in the wrong and I feel like she's really trying to just save her image here. And personally, I feel like it's backfiring. Now, our last story for the news update actually came in yesterday. So yesterday, Page Six reported that below deck sailing yacht star Gary King is being accused of sexually assaulting staff members. Now, this is coming after just weeks after the explosive below deck down under episode in which Bosun Luke was caught by production naked in third stew Margot's bed while she was passed out from a night of drinking. Thankfully, they were able to get him out of her room before anything happened, but he did get into the bed with her, got under her covers, and when he was told to come down, he tried to slam the door in production's face multiple times. And this is the door from Margot's room, because again, he's in her room, not his room. Thankfully, though, they were able to get him out, like he really didn't put that much of a fight But then he was then sent to a hotel for the rest of the night and was fired the next day by Captain Jason. And I have to say, without going into too much detail, like Captain Jason and Chief Stu Aisha, 
they were absolute rock stars in how they handled this situation because it was t- honestly it was terrifying to like watch because spoilers like the power does go out during this part but like i said the way that Aisha and Captain Jason handled the situation. I mean, literally just perfect. However, I can't say the same for <laughs> this case. On the spin off series, Below Deck Sailing Yacht, Gary King, the first mate, is said to have, quote, forced himself, end quote, onto a member of the makeup crew. And it is a woman named who has come forward and given her name. Her name is Samantha Suarez. She said that she had met King when the cast and crew went to Sardinia, Italy for shooting. She stated that the crew stayed at a hotel during filming and that it was also said that cast would stay there as well at nights and on their off days. Excuse me. Now, during an off day in July 2022, Suarez was working with a talent manager and was accompanying King back to his room at the hotel after filming. King, of course, was drunk. And if you've ever watched the show, you know how fucked up they get when Charter is over and they have a free night. So she brings him back to his hotel room and she stated that he was, quote, behaving erratically, end quote. She stated he did this by yelling off of his balcony, trying to get other cast members to leave their rooms, which, according to her, was not allowed. She stated that King begged her not to leave his room and she joked that she would sit outside of his door in order to prevent him from leaving. From there, Suarez alleges that King asked her to get into bed with him. Meanwhile, he's already in a relationship at this time. Now, I can't confirm this because Sailing Yacht is literally my least favorite below deck, so I literally don't watch it, but that was what was said in this article. Thankfully, Samantha was able to leave You know, but she did return later with water and snacks because that's what she was told to do so, you know, by talent management. So when King opened the door, she said that he was wearing only his underwear. He took the water in and she followed him in and, of course, again, asked not for her not to leave his room. Suarez tried to tell him, you know, that she had other cast members' rooms she needed to visit and give them, you know, water and snacks too, but he wasn't about it. She said that King still persisted, and when she turned to the door to leave, she stated that King, quote, came up behind her, grabbed her, and pressed her body against his body and refused to let her go, end quote. She also stated that she, quote, tried to kick and elbow him to get him off of her and thankfully was able to get out of her grasp, but sadly he slammed the door shut from behind her. Thankfully, once King allegedly let go of the door, she was able to get out and get into the hallway. And it seemed like he might have followed behind her. But the talent manager that she was working with had been calling her and she was finally able to answer. And when she answered, she told him what had happened. Or them. I'm sorry. I really don't know the gender. I'm just speculating. (laughs) I apologize. So she said to them, obviously she told them everything that had happened. And when she spoke to production the next day, she told them everything that had happened. Now, it was said that she was allegedly reassured by producers that he would be fired. But instead, they just had King stay on the boat. For the duration of filming. And I mean, just wow, bravo, wow. 
And in this situation, like, I definitely want to call out the double standard because I feel like for the fact that she's not a cast member and that her attack wasn't caught on camera, they don't want to make it as serious as it is. You know, but again, I don't know 100%. That's just how I feel. Now, if what allegedly happened to Samantha Suarez wasn't bad enough, other crew members have come forward. These cast members have chosen, or cast and crew members have chosen to remain anonymous, but here are some of their claims. Now, one alleges that King is, quote, next level scary with women, end quote. Another stated that they wit- th- blah, blah, that they witnessed King grab a female cast member's butt and touch her inappropriately. Inappropriately, Jesus, I can speak. Even after she had asked him to stop, it was also said that he allegedly was caught grabbing the genitals of a cam of a male camera operator and a member of the production crew. Now, it was also stated that King was given multiple verbal warnings. And why they were just verbal, I don't fucking know. But again, like I said earlier, the double fucking standard, right? Now, hopefully they will handle this situation. But Bravo and NBC are under fire because, you know, of this and other situations. They're under fire for... Subjecting their reality stars to, quote, grotesque and depraved mistreatment, end quote. Both networks have responded, saying that they are, quote, committed to maintaining a safe and respectful workplace for cast and crew in our reality shows, end quote. Personally, I call BS. But we will see as time goes on. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to take a quick break and we will come back with this week's main case. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and I am so excited to be talking about Broadview Press. You might be asking, what is Broadview Press, Andrew? Broadview is an independent academic publisher in the humanities that produces high-quality, pedagogically useful books for use in university and college classrooms. They publish in the humanities mainly English studies, writing, philosophy, and history, just to name a few genres. And recently, I had on Dr. Jason Holt, who wrote all about the philosophy of sport. And what better summer episode than to talk about What happens when a philosopher dissects the beautiful aesthetics of sporting culture? In the spring, I had on doctors Kyle Stedman and Tanya Rodriguez to talk about what is sound writing, how to make audio projects in the college classroom, how to even have your students create podcasts. And then in the winter, I had on Dr. Dr. Jeffrey Weinstock. He talked about analyzing pop culture. Yes, I even sneak in some Real Housewives questions. And how to teach composition and make it fun. He uses this whole metaphor about being a mad scientist in this gothic lab. And in the fall, I had on Dr. Ann Stevens, and she talked about literary theory and criticism. And yes, the university season is upon us. So What better way to talk about the college classroom than to actually understand what is literary theory? That's a wonderful episode for all of you out there who teach literary studies. I love Broadview Press. Make sure you use their exclusive code. It's Ivory Tower on broadviewpress.com. You get 20% off all, all Broadview Press publications. Okay, until the next Broadview Press interview. And now back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. LGBT stories are universal, but each one speaks to the individual heart and soul of the writer telling it. Do you have a story to tell? Or have you been moved recently by an LGBT book, film, painting, television show, or other form of media? Then the Gay and Lesbian Review wants to hear from you. The GNLR believes in bringing awareness to queer art and artists through reviews, 
commentary, and thought pieces in which the author relates their personal lives to a particular piece of art, a novel, a movie, or what have you. In addition to the print magazine, the GNLR also publishes articles on its blog as well as personal essays on its popular Here's My Story section on glreview.org. That's G-L-R-E-V-I-E-W dot org. To learn more about submitting an article for the GNLR, visit their writer's guidelines. The link is located at the bottom of the homepage. And if you have any questions, email publisher Stephen Hemrick. That's S-T-E-P-H-E-N dot H-E-M-R-I-C-K at glreview.org. The GNLR and its readers can't wait to see what you have to say. Hi, everyone. This is Andrew, and I am interrupting what I know is such an exciting Ivory Tower Boiler Room episode to tell you all about one of my favorite podcasts. It's called That Old Gay Classic Cinema, and it's hosted by Christian Garcia. Christian is joined with guest co-hosts to talk about classic cinema films that we know and love, and he analyzes them through a queer lens. So he's talked about The Sound of Music, Alfred Hitchcock, The Wizard of Oz, Sleeping Beauty, 101 Dalmatians, and recently, Hello, Dolly. I actually was on his first ever episode to talk about my love of the sound of music and playing Captain Von Trapp in my high school musical. Then I was joined with Mary DePippi, the host of True Crime in Academia, and our friend Travis Roundtree to talk about Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo. Mary just had Christian on True Crime in Academia to talk about female poisoners, including the evil queen from Snow White and actual real life female poisoners. So Christian's podcast is the best. You must add it to your listen list. After you listen to this episode, make sure you head over to That Old Gay Classic Cinema on Apple and Spotify. Make sure you follow him on Instagram at That Old Gay Classic Cinema. And he's also on TikTok. Don't forget TikTok. Okay. I can't wait for you all to listen to that old gay classic cinema. And now back to the ivory tower boiler room. Morning. Do not eat while listening to this episode. Trust me, you don't want to do it. Because this case involves cannibalism. Mark James Kilroy was born on March 5, 1968 in Chicago, Illinois, to parents James and Helen Kilroy. Now, his father, James, worked as a chemical engineer, and his mother, Helen, worked as a volunteer paramedic. The family moved to Santa Fe, Texas, shortly after Mark was born, and the couple soon after had a second son named Keith. The Kilroy family was very Catholic, so Mark attended church every Sunday, and I also think attended Catholic school. He was good at sports, particularly baseball, basketball, and golf. He was gifted also academically. He ranked 14th in a class of 210 students at Santa Fe High School. Now, aside from his aforementioned sports, he was also a member of the student council in his high school and an honor student. Mark graduated high school in 1986 and started his freshman year at Southwest Texas State University. He later then transferred to Terleton. Again, we all know I suck at saying names, but that's what it looks like. Terleton State University. And it seemed that he went there for a basketball scholarship. Now, while he was there, he also became a member of Limbada Chi or Chi Alpha fraternity. Again, I I know nothing about these Greek letters, so that's just my guess. <laughs> I'm sorry. But from then, he decided, Mark decided, that he was going to focus more on his academics and eventually transfer for the last time to University of Texas in Austin. And there he decided he wanted to be a pre-med student and started prepping for his MCAT, or the Medical College Admissions Test. 
During his junior year, 21-year-old Mark and his three high school sports friends, Bill Huddleston, Bradley Moore, and Brent Martin, decided that they were going to take a trip on spring break to South Pay or so, I'm sorry, South Padre Island in the Gulf of Mexico and is said to also be considered a part of Texas. Um from the pictures that I'll have for you of the map of it, like it is literally a very short distance between Texas and Mex- and blah, 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 Mexico. The island itself is a very thin like line looking type of island and if you look on social media you'll see what I'm talking about because I posted a picture of course now on Friday March 10th 1989 the boys drove the nine hours until they reached some Padre Island all four boys checked into the Sheridan Hotel and Resort shortly before midnight that day now There aren't many people at the hotel at this time because according to like the hotel and the area, you know, and whatnot, this was considered an early time for spring break. And essentially like their spring break period was like a five week period. So, you know, they're on the earlier end of things. Now, over the next few days, the boys went to the beach. They went to the Miss Tanline contests. They flirted with all of the female students, went to the bars, the clubs. Like, they did all of the things. Now, on Sunday, March 12th, the boys decided to cross Rio Grande and head into Matamoros, Mexico. Again, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly. I apologize. We're just going to go with it, okay? So, Madame Morris has one main attraction for spring breakers, and that is its wide avenue of bars and discos, and that is called Cale Alvaro Obregon. That is my guess, again. I suck at pronouncing things. I apologize if I got that wrong. That was just my attempt. But it was said, you know, that this alleyway, like, had a lot of cheap beers and things like that. And it was just a huge tourist destination. Destination, I swear I can speak, good lord. On the way to this, you know, little destination in Matamoros, Matamoros, the guys decided they're going to stop for burgers. And while they're there, they meet this foursome of college girls who are also going there as well. And they kind of like ask them for directions, which again, this is like the 80s. So, of course, they ask them for directions, you know, guys. So, they do that, and they decide that they're going to meet up at a club called Sergeant Peppers, which, you know, I'm sure is an homage to the Beatles. <laughs> According to Bill Huddleston, he said that they drank and they danced till about 2.30 before they decided that they were going to head back to the Sheridan Hotel. Hi, this is Andrew, and I'm interrupting what I know is an exciting ITBR episode to talk to you about one of our sponsors, the Gay and Lesbian Review. Discover new things about gay and lesbian literature, history, and culture with a subscription to the Gay and Lesbian Review, a bi-monthly magazine of history, culture, and politics that publishes essays in a wide range of disciplines, as well as a slew of reviews of books, plays, and movies, and a number of special features, such as artist profiles and our popular art memo column. Each issue of the Gay and Lesbian Review brings you consistently intelligent, lively, thought-provoking articles focused on a unifying theme, and it brings together the leading minds on the topic. You won't find a lot about the latest dating fads or fashion trends, but you will definitely find articles about online dating, like using Grindr as a social phenomenon, or even the gay influence on 20th century fashion. 
Did you know that I've actually interviewed three gay and lesbian review contributors? Make sure you listen to my Ignacio Darnod breaking the gay code in art episode, where Ignacio explains that key artistic figures like Michelangelo, Donatello, Thomas Eakins, J.C. Leyendecker, and Thomas Finlan all have really explicit homoerotic artwork. And then head on over to the next episode where I talk with Dr. Vernon Rosario about LGBTQ psychiatry and how homosexuality got depathologized. And our most recent episode was with the Gay and Lesbian Review's literary editor, Martha E. Stone, and she talks about what LGBTQ literature you should be reading this summer and also how to become a contributing writer and a reviewer for the Gay and Lesbian Review. To subscribe, visit glreview.org. That's G-L-R-E-V-I-E-W dot org. Click subscribe and enter the promo code ITBR to receive a free copy with any print or digital subscription. And as an added bonus, you also receive online access to all of the Gay and Lesbian Review's archived issues. All of them. Okay, enjoy your reading, everyone. Hey, Ivory Tower Boiler Room listeners and true crime friends. You've heard me gush over this incredible woman and her beautiful products. I'm talking about Mandy Made It. Mandy makes customized and original crochet and cut goods. They are the perfect, unique, one-of-a-kind gift for literally anyone in your life. And she makes incredible home decor. I still have my pumpkins that I put out every fall. I just love them. Check her out on Instagram at M-A-N-D-E-E, Made It, or search Mandy Made It on Facebook. To order, just slide into her DMs. And if you mention the Ivory Tower Boiler Room, you will receive a free personalized gift with your first order. So go on Instagram and look up at Mandy Made It, and Mandy is spelled M-A-N-D-E-E. Again, her handle is at Mandy Made It, Mandy spelled M-A-N-D-E-E, and order today. The next day, it was said that Mark attended another Miss Tan-like contest and met up with a former frat brother at a condo party. At around 10.30 p.m., all four boys went back to Matamoros, and they parked on the border of Texas and Mexico and crossed on foot like they did before. So essentially what they would do is they would park on the U.S. Texas side, and then cross over into Mexico. It was said that that night there were considerably more tourists. And when the boys see this, they decide that they're going to go with the bar with the shortest line. And that bar is Los Sombreros. They then go from there to a, another bar that is hard rock themed. And it, like I said, it's just like a few blocks down. Not like I said, but like it's a few blocks down and they decide, you know, it's more Americanized. So they want to go there. Now, at this point, Mark is said to have been chatting up one of the Miss Tan Line contestants and kind of drifted away from the group here and there. But eventually she does leave on her own and the boys decide that they're going to head back. While they're on their way back, and it's estimated that this was a roughly around 200 feet before the border, Bill Huddleston has to pee, which I completely relate to. Now, according to Bill, he stated that he saw a Mexican man motioning in their direction, but he brushed it off to being someone that Mark could have possibly have known. According to a Rolling Stone article, 
Bill stated that he heard a man say to Mark, quote, didn't I just see you somewhere, end quote, or, quote, where did I last see you, end quote. So, according to him, he just doesn't think too much of it. And, you know, I'm not saying that he was wrong not to suspect anything, but, you know, being a woman, being born of the female sex, we are honestly trained to always assume that something is wrong. Especially in a situation like this where, you know, there's kind of sort of stranger danger. Not all, but, you know, just to an extent, there's some sort of stranger danger. Now, Bill joined back up with the other friends, Brett, Brent Martin and Bradley Moore, but realized that Mark wasn't with them. They waited a few minutes before leaving, thinking maybe that Mark just got a ride back to the hotel and they went there as well. Now, there are some sources that said that the boys searched until 4.30 a.m. However, though, based off of the boys' statements, it kind of seems opposite. Bill even said when we woke the next morning and we still hadn't heard from him, That's when we knew something was wrong, end quote. At this point, the boys then contacted the police and reported, reported Mark missing. Mark's parents, of course, were notified and they traveled down to South Padre Island as soon as they could to assist with the investigation. They also led searches and handed out leaflets whenever they could. Over the next weeks, the Kilroys offered a $15,000 reward for any information about Mark's whereabouts. Mr. and Mrs. Kilroy met with Attorney General Jim Maddox, Governor William Clements, and Senator Lloyd Benston. The Kilroys did everything they could to find their son, but police on both sides of the border suspected foul play. One source claims that a hypnotist was called to hypnotize Bradley Moore, who stated that under hypnosis that he had seen Mark talking to an Hispanic man with a cut on his face. Now, on March 26, Mark's case was highlighted on America's Most Wanted. It gave Mark's case nationwide attention and it generated a lot of leads that sadly mostly turned out to be false or just dead ends. Now, I want to state at some point that, you know, because of the lack of technology, his parents had to withdraw him from classes, and I hate that for them, you know, because it should seem like such a instant, quick thing, but again, because of the time period, it just wasn't, and... You know, it's not like you could send an email like you actually had to call. And (sighs) that just makes me sad that that, uh, uh, you know. Now, a break in the case came on April 1st. Mexican federales at a checkpoint came across a vehicle that ran a roadblock without stopping. Police decided that they were going to follow this car using an unmarked vehicle, and saw that it had traveled out of Santa Elena Ranch. And I know I'm pronouncing that right, because that is my sister's name, Like, and it is spelled the exact same way, so bam! There we go. There's one thing, one name that I know, for sure, without a doubt. And this was just outside of, sorry, sidetrack, this was just outside of Matamoros. Now, police, for some reason, decided to sit on this vehicle and waited for the driver to leave before raiding the ranch that it had been parked at. So, obviously, there's some information we don't know. Clearly, they had a reason to do this. So, you know, but at least, you know, it's happening. 
Now, during the search, police discovered cult paraphernalia and obtained the identity of the river. A man named Serafin Hernandez Garcia. He was the nephew of a local drug lord and per- and police, excuse me, arrested him alongside his uncle Elio Hernandez Rivera and other cult members, specifically David Cerna Valdez, Sergio Martim Salinas, and Domingo Reyes Bustamante. Bustamante. Now, according to Hernandez Garcia, Mark's death was ordered by Adolfo Constanzo, who was the leader of this satanic cult that the people who I had mentioned beforehand were all a part of. Costanza had wanted to sacrifice a white man as, like, you know, their main sacrifice. Now, Hernandez Garcia, Hernandez Garcia, blah, 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 stated that he and the other members of the cult had hung out during the spring breakers and the night that Mark went missing. So, like, they were in the area, basically. Hernandez Garcia admitted that Mark was lured by one of the members to the truck. Garcia and another member named Malio Fabio Ponce Torres grabbed and wrestled Mark into the truck. It is said that Mark was able to escape, but only to be stopped by an allied vehicle who took him prisoner at gunpoint, allegedly. This is all allegedly unfortunately. Cannibalistic actions occur from here on out. So if you need to skip, your time is now. Also, if you are fine and want to listen, if you're eating, just stop right now because trust me, you don't want to be. Mark was met with unimaginable amounts of torture before his death. According to many sources, Mark was sodomized and raped before his murder via machete that was used to slice like his skull in half. The cult members then buried Mark with a wire tied around his spine and the wire they had sticking out of the ground. And they did this so that way they could pull his spine from the ground and make it into a necklace. It was also said that, you know, they (sighs) ate his brain. Hernandez Garcia said that this was done at Costanza's request. So, if you are squeamish and didn't want to hear about all the gory details, you can come back now. Now, Hernandez Garcia took police to the burial site where they discovered around 13 to 15 bodies. The exact number has still not been confirmed. During the investigation of the ranch, there were signs of human remains along with other animal body parts. But, however, they noted that there were no signs of actual cannibalism. It was also confirmed that Mark's death was some sort of human sacrifice. The cult members suspected to be involved, all of the names that I had mentioned beforehand, were arrested on May 6th. At this point, though, Costanzo, the suspected cult leader, had already died. Allegedly, he had ordered for himself and his right-hand man to be killed before a police raid. By 1998, all involved who weren't already dead were charged and sentenced with decades-long sentences. As of 2009, only two suspects remain at large. So, thankfully, you know, everyone who needed to be charged. I mean, I wish they could have gotten everyone all at once. I mean, it is just... It is such a... Like, 
Oh my god, I feel like it's such a freak thing and crazy thing and obviously just overall absolutely horrific. I mean, seriously, like literally no one wants to be subjected to being a sacrifice of a fucking cult. Like that is just, nope, absolutely not. So, you know, I mean with all these sort, like I fucking hate them. I hate that people did this to these people, you know, regardless of what case I'm talking about, obviously, you know, but in this specifically, you know, just being a victim to a fucking like a cannibalistic cult, essentially, you know, like that is mm, mm. (sighs) I hate it. Well, Like I said earlier on, I am about to set on my vacation, not having to think about this ever, well, not really ever again, but for the next week. So, until I come back from vacation, my loves, I will see you all later. Please do not forget to follow True Crime and Academia on social media, at True Crime and Academia on Instagram and TikTok, and at TC in academia on twitter slash x i think that's what it's called now um you know sorry old millennial here but yeah that's what we go we got going on so until i come back from my vacation my loves i will see you all later thank you so much for listening to the ivory tower boiler room this is andrew rimby the host and director of the ivory tower boiler room podcast i am joined with mary de pippi our chief contributor and host of true crime and academia please if you're not make sure that you follow the ivory tower boiler room and true crime and academia on instagram and twitter And TikTok, too. Remember our TikTok? That's where all the exciting video clips are posted. Make sure that you join our Patreon if you want more Ivory Tower Boiler Room and True Crime and Academia content. All the video interviews are on our Patreon. All of our bonus episodes are on Patreon. And it just means so much for you to join for $5 a month. You unlock all of our bonus episodes. And also, it just helps support the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Thank you so much for giving Mary and I a needed jolt of caffeine for coffee. Thanks for the $5. Head to patreon.com slash Ivory Tower Boiler Room. We cannot wait for you all to listen to our summer season. There are so many exciting episodes. And we're also celebrating three years of the Ivory Tower Boiler Room podcast. So. Without further ado, thanks for listening. Make sure you listen to the next episode next week. And have a wonderful summer season, everyone. Okay, bye now.